Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, if I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you yet in person, my name is Moira Anderson, and I am the Associate Director of Public Programming here at Crystal Bridges. Can we just pause and recognize what a gorgeous day it is to welcome you all into the Great House and this weekend to celebrate the Dirty South exhibition. I'd like to begin this morning by acknowledging our indigenous peoples. As Crystal Bridges, we recognize our role as settlers and guests in the Northwest Arkansas region. We acknowledge the Caddo, Quapaw, and Osage, as well as the many indigenous caretakers of this land and water. We appreciate the enduring influence of the vibrant, diverse, and contemporary cultures of indigenous peoples. We are conscious of the role in colonizations that museums have played. And as cultural institutions, we have a responsibility to engage in the dismantling of historical and systemic invisibility of indigenous peoples past, present, and future. We choose to intentionally hold ourselves accountable to appropriate conversation, representation, connection, and education to facilitate a space of measurable change. Today, we are absolutely thrilled to welcome artists, scholars, and performers in conversation centered around the Dirty South, contemporary art, material culture, and the sonic impulse. This weekend is absolutely monumental, which brings together incredible talent that celebrates the exhibition. Over the next couple days, we will be welcoming artists from the exhibition in conversation, musicians and poets inspired by the art, both local and national. They're performing tomorrow on Walker Landing. I hope to see everybody back. And of course, we're welcoming you as our valued guests to connect to the work even further throughout the weekend. I'd like to express our sincere gratitude to those who have made this program possible to Valerie Castle Oliver and the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts for organizing this exhibition. <laughs> to our sponsors of the Dirty South exhibition, Harrison and Rhonda French family, Ramsey, Jaquita, and Sarah Ball, Catherine and Steve Enroche, Esther Silver Parker, and Deborah Wright. The project is also supported in part by a grant from the Arkansas Humanity Council and the National Endowment of the Humanities. I'd like to also spend a, or send a special thank you to the entire learning and engagement team here at the museum for your outstanding efforts and support in making this weekend possible, especially Michelle Flanoy, Megan Kenny, Kim Lee, and Megan Banta. And of course, to our generous speakers throughout the day today. We're gonna kick off this morning with a program uh, that's going to be an introductory talk featuring artists Ramel Ross, Bethany Collins, and of course, led in conversation by Valerie Castle Oliver, the Sydney and Francis Lewis Family Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. It's such a pleasure to welcome you all. Let's welcome our speakers this morning. Thank you so much. It is such an honor to be here and uh, very thankful to Crystal Bridges for all of the effort and love that they have taken on this, this exhibition um, and its um, extensions by program. I am delighted to be in conversation with Bethany Collins and Ramel Ross, uh, both who are featured in the exhibition. and. Oftentimes people will ask, you know, how do you select um, artists for the exhibition? How are works selected for the exhibition? This will give you a little bit of insight into that um, because both of their practices speak so beautifully to, to the exhibition and its themes um, and what we hope to uncover. Um, it is a, a expansive exhibition featuring a hundred and 40 artists, uh, 102 artists and 142 works. So choosing artists that were really pinpointed toward the idea um, that were intergenerational, that really spoke to that notion of the sonic impulse uh, was very important um, 
So with that, I'll just begin because uh, how I came to know Bethany's work and Ramel's work, and uh, as we're speaking, you'll see that their works are um, scrolling behind us, so you'll get a sense of what their practices are. But first, I'll address uh, Bethany and uh, just make a few comments and then ask a few questions. Uh, I first met Bethany at the Studio Museum in Harlem when she was an artist in residence. And again, when I had first moved uh, to Virginia, she was having an exhibition at um, an arts organization called 1708. Uh, and in that exhibition, she was working with text-based works uh, from hymnals um, that really spoke to the notion of not only color, but spirit and idea, what was captured within um, the hymnals in terms of songs and motion. Uh, and so with that, um, it really began to set off uh, some ideas about how to incorporate that work into what at that time uh, was an exhibition, really speaking, only contemporary artists uh, to sounds uh, coming out of the South, and in particular, um, contemporary um, hip hop um, from the 1990s. So, but with that, I was very interested in how you arrived at this notion around text. Uh, I was really blown away because a lot of times it was about excising language away from the text to reveal particular um, sentiments or meanings or changing, um, reverbing in a very different way of what songs really spoke to. Yeah. So can you talk just briefly about your arrival at working with text and then with historical text? Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, the first time I used, uh, the first time language enters my practice was in grad school. I was the only black grad student in a peer group of primarily white grads, and the critiques were just really awkward and strange, and I'm not a good first responder, so it takes me a minute. Um, but like the second time you ask me a question, I'll have a really good response. Mm -hmm. So I started to take that language from critiques, Mr. Walker knows this in this work, the White Noise series, um, and write it over and over again. And so that obsessive repetition is something that still, I'm still interested in. It's still a really good tactic because it makes, it like can divorce language from meaning so it can become transformed. The more you repeat it, it loses that origin source. But it can also make it sacred. Um, it can also make it musical. It can make it beautiful. So what starts off as like a problem in the language, by the time you write it 100 times and have obsessed on it enough, you've like worked it out and excised it, then maybe it, it has the potential to transform into something much more lovely by the end. The hymnals came you know, much later. It's one of the first works that I made after the 2016 presidential election. And I came across this, um, it's like a, a type of early American song called a contrafacta. So these are songs that retain the same melody. Star Spangled Banner is one, My Country Tis of Thee, Dixie is another. The melody is consistent, but the lyrics are rewritten over time for different political social causes. So My Country Tis of Thee has been rewritten at least 100 times in support of suffrage, temperance, uh, native sovereignty. The Confederacy has their versions of the song. So do, so do abolitionists and the Union Army. I bound 100 versions of those uh, songs together and then burned away the musical notation so that all that is left like the song, you can't sing it anymore, that's absent. The thing that was holding us all together post-2016 is the song that's gone. All that's left is this 100 dissenting, often opposing versions of what it means to be American, mm -hmm. but they're forced together into one text. They must abide one another. Um, so that was the, I think that was one of the first yeah. language-based works. Mm -hmm. Mm, yeah. Beautiful. And then turning quickly to Ramel, and I'm going to follow up on that too, um, because I want to get to the uh, In Mississippi yeah. and that series that is featured actually in the exhibition. But Ramel, I, I, I'm not quite sure exactly where I saw Caspira. Caspira is the image that graces the cover of the catalog, Dirty South. But for me, when I saw that image, um, it really touched on all of the elements that I wanted to bring out. It touched upon landscape, it touched upon a sort of spirituality, this notion of, of seeing without sight. And then this idea of the black body in that landscape. 
So to me, it held the trilogy, if you will, of, of, of the ideas that are all, you know, all of the work sort of um, is in, in, in orbit around in the exhibition. So, um, and then I, tra I knew that you did the, the film, Hell County, this morning, this evening, but I didn't realize that you also had an autonomous photography practice. Mm. So talk about briefly Hale County, getting to, um, getting to Hale County, and then where both the moving image through the lens and the static image from the lens emerges. Yeah, brief is so hard, and so there'll be some gaps, of course. Okay, well, I'll, I'll stop you. Okay, you yeah. Because that's how we do it here. Hit okay. the hand. <laughs> Hit the hand. Um, but I'm sure many of you know Hell County, Alabama, has a historic um, precedence in its relationship to being the sort of foundation for um, or an, an argument for the foundation of a documentary photographic aesthetic. Um, also, you have sort of James E.G. and Walker Evans, you know, making this book, Let Us Now Praise Famous Men, um, which purpose essentially was to introduce uh, the image of poverty of the South to the grander United States in order to generate uh, sort of goodwill um, and, um, you know, explain the, the problems that are happening there. And so I moved to Hell County coincidentally um, and I was already making photos and, and taking pictures to teach and coach basketball. And I sort of fell in love with the landscape and the place, and I ended up staying, and my photographic practice converted to one that was kind of quite naturally investigating my relationship as a, a black northerner with southern roots to this landscape, which is the historic south. And it being in Hell County allowed for there to be a sort of confrontation with what we even imagine to be rural America, what we imagine to be uh, possible disenfranchisement, what we imagine to be um, some of the origin landscapes of what we know as uh, what has become, even particularly now, um, American ideological uh, you know, machinations, I guess. And so um, I use a large format camera, 4x5 and 8x10. I'm really interested in the dialogue that happens between those old forms and slow pace of uh, you know, of articulating the world. Um, and I'm gonna like cut that off really fast and just speak quickly to what Bethany said, which I think I haven't heard someone speak in terms of the way that they're working with language and redaction um, mm -hmm. that overlap with the way in which I think about images and looking, um, I, I made a film, Hell County, this morning, this evening, and if, if you know anything about my photographs, there's some sort of stillness and slowness to them. And the way in which you talked about the repetition of writing words, allowing for that process to provide a sort of disintegration and then uh, sort of recapitulation or a, a new reorganization, the process of looking is also a practice of time repetition. Mm. Um, it's a process of, if you, the longer you stare at a word, obviously it does that same process, um, and then you're allowed to reformulate it once you snap out of that sort of days of, of uh, non-socialization, the days of socialization and non-socialization, to like re-understand what it means. And to do that with people, mm -hmm. I think, is something that most people don't spend time doing, right? Specifically with the camera, you don't look at someone long enough for the disintegration that happens with language to happen with the person and the social constructs that are tied to them. Mm -hmm. And when that is allowed to emerge into a sort of a, a awake or aware um, some, being aware to the grander systematic uh, impulses. It's, it's a beautiful thing to, to see things afresh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I love this idea about marrying the image with the language. Mm -hmm. and, but, but coming back to the idea of process and repetition and fragmentization and then rebirth from that. Because that's in base what improvisation does, right? It fragments something, takes it apart, dissolves it, reconstitutes it in a different way. Which we could go all the way back to commit with that, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, it is very interesting. But your idea and your connection with the individuals there mm -hmm. is really beautiful because Hale County does speak to it, it med it's a meditation, mm. I guess, in the end. It becomes a meditative. And the meditation on the individuals that you feature, you know, in, in this, this film, and how it translates into the still image. Mm. So w was there a sense of um, 
in jumping back and forth, how do you go through your practice? Is it that you work with film and the moving image and then move into stills? Are these things simultaneous? Do you work back and forth? Which would seem natural, but for some people they do separate these two practices um, in, to in their totality in that way. Yeah, it's a very easy thing to articulate to myself, but I think it's hard to convey to someone, as most things typically are, that's, that's not sort of in my personhood, because the differences to me are both stark and imaginary, you know? They're like, you know, imposed, um, but also like really intentional. I think with, when I use the moving image camera with my friends and family now in Hale County, Alabama, um, I'm interested in what happens uh, you know, I like to, cinema to me is, is quite different than most other art forms, arguably aside from music, because it allows you to carry consciousness. Um, you're allowed to sort of woo someone into a, a, a time-based relationship to what you're, what you're, what you're doing. It's a trance. Um, and to trance someone into what I see or what I believe in the context of Hell County in the South being the sort of origin, you know, the culture sack of, of black American identity, the origin of, uh, of our aesthetic, essentially, um, and our, our image as it relates to popular culture, um, is, I think, one of the most profound things possible. Like, it's the closest thing we can get to bridging first person, first person. Um, and for still images, I think, and, and also, and as you know, I'm interested in, in the moving image as it relates to the ambiguity that's, that a lot, uh, uh, provides a plural interpretation of what it means to be a person of color in the world at all times. This double narrative of this person has a relationship to slavery and this can be interpreted in this way, but this person is also just a person and doing something. And so you need to have this other context to always layer on, which is blackness as a Rorschach for your relationship to blackness mm. um, allows you to connect, but with the still image, there's a sort of a pinpointed ambiguity. Um, there's there's a, a f it's to me it's not frozen because I'm going to talk way too at length. I got got to stop. Have to stop. To me, the photograph isn't frozen because it's frozen literally. But like most things in the world aren't aren't literal. Most things in the world have uh, subtext that that r r run run rampant. Um, but that image also provides secrets over time, and it also changes over time. And so to think of the still image as, as uh, a frozen thing is just to concentrate on the, tech, the technical aspect, just to concentrate on the shutter, just to concentrate on the Cartier-Bresson's decisive moment, mm. which we know um, is, is a wonderful articulation of what photography was doing at that moment, but also kind of erases the complexity of the technology and its relationship to influence and, and truth, I guess, if that's something to be talked about. Mm. So uh, beautiful segues. I love this. And so speaking of truths and the complexities of, of, of moments, one of the things that I was so moved by, the work that's featured in the exhibition in Mississippi, is the uncovering of the complexity of the black experience. We, we, it is about the black imaginary because oftentimes we're looking at a period of enslavement uh, through the residuals of it, yeah. right? I mean, we're looking at the impact and the, the imprint that we still carry with us today. But understanding what it was mm -hmm. beyond narratives is really about the black imaginary, mm. right? It's reconstituting the, the ideas of what the horror must have been like and the complexities of that. And moving beyond that, you know, during this period after the proclamation uh, is signed in 1863, there was that period of reconstruction that we are taught about, but again, beyond the legislature and the, the, the shifting of what that was, what the world was like beyond the migratory patterns out of the South. Mm -hmm. um, you brought in this eloquent moment, which I never concentrated on or even thought about, which was the, the ways in which people were trying to reconstitute families. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we live with the legacy of fragmented families. 
fragmented family structures. But in the immediate aftermath of slavery, people were looking for their loved ones, placing ads in papers throughout uh, with, the, with the help of, of, of uh, the churches and uh, the Freedmen's Bureau. And you bring that to light, and yet it is obscured in the same manner. So can you talk about how you found this particular, your way to this particular uh, history, and then the presentation of why you present and yet obscure that yeah. information as well. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, so Heather Williams has a, Heather Andrea Williams has a lovely book called Help Me to Find My People. This is her, based around her scholarship. And then there's a church in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, Mother Bethel Church, mm -hmm. who's working with Villanova University, all of these, to digitize these ads. The classified ads, though, are, they're placed in at least, at least six different black newspapers, mostly across the southeast and then upward, right, across the east coast. And they're placed by formerly enslaved people looking for their family post-emancipation. I mean, it's really like shortly before the end of the Civil War, all the way up until the 1920s. Sometimes you'll see people post once. It's like a one-off kind of shot in the dark, right? And then sometimes you'll see them post annually, and it becomes a kind of recurring ad. They're still looking for their family. Every once in a while, it leads to a reunification, but as you can imagine, they're separated by right, slavery and then war and then also the aftermath of emancipation and the dispersal of people, right? What's interesting to me in looking at those ads, I was focusing on, you know, the 1890s, post-Reconstruction, this moment of redemption, what a lot of historians call the nadir of race relations in the 1890s, when it is the worst for us mm -hmm. that people continue to look for their kin, right? That they continue this kind of like hope and faith towards the future that there may be reunification. I should also say I made these works after the family separation crisis at the border, mm -hmm. and that repetition is not just present in the ads, in the like people continuing to ask, in the way that they ask, that, rep that becomes a chorus. But it is also this kind of chorus of you know, terror, that this particular kind of American form of control of a people by separating you from your children and the, the ones that you love, that that's not new. The chorus, though, that you know, is interesting to me in terms of this like, love of repetition is that you know, most people are illiterate at the time, most people are not getting the newspaper, and so you see uh, a lot of ministers, especially in the South, read these classified ads from the pulpit. Mm. And people hear them and they start to ask in the same way, and that becomes the kind of repeating question, that longing for your kin. Can you help me to find my people? Over and over again. I am all alone in the world. Over and over again. Sorry. It's understandable, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, have you seen her? Have you seen them? I last saw them in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. It's early. I haven't had enough coffee. Um, no. But then the process for making them is this blind emboss that I've come back to over and over again, too. That's a repeated process for me. So the blind emboss is taking, um, looking at the digitized ads that... Um, Mother Bethel is digitizing in Philadelphia, and then engraving that text backward into acrylic plates, soaking the paper, and then running that engraved backwards text, wet, malleable paper on top through the press. It forces the paper, it's a lot of pressure, into the grooves of that plate. And when you lift it up, the text is now like, um, you know, you're printing nothing, essentially. There's an inkless process. It is a kind of haunting in that way. There's nothing there. But it is at the same time, it is the paper itself that becomes a kind of braille, right? That's what blind emboss is. And so the, the legibility or illegibility of it is important to me. It always has been with blind emboss. The first time I used it was with the pattern or practice, mm -hmm. which is a blind embossing of the, almost the entire Ferguson report um, out of Missouri. It's important because, you know, you can read it. It's hard on the eyes, especially with this black paper. Mm -hmm. It sucks all the light mm -hmm. into it holds the light. Mm -hmm. But you can read it if you work hard enough. And at the same time, there's a way in which I think it can only be understood like Braille through touch. 
right? It's that physical embodiment of it. And if you are forbidden from touching it, there's a way that you will never understand it. If you have not lived it, then you'll never understand it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's both of those things, that desire to touch and being kind of withheld and and it's, it is not always for you, mm -hmm. that that's embodied in the work too. Yeah. yeah it's beautiful, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you for that, and um, thank you for your practice because it, it, it is bringing to the forefront these, these things that, that have absorbed the light, if you will, and we are still living with the legacies of these things, um, even if you want to parallel the Ferguson Report yeah. to those issues. Um, we're looking at, right now on the screen, um, images, speaking of reconstituting ideas around history and, and living history and how it continues to impact us. Um, you, did a re, um, you did a performance based on Henry Box Brown, mm. right? And so that's what you were seeing in the earlier um, um, images that were flowing here is uh, the um, reenactment of Henry Box Brown's, uh, Henry Box Brown's uh, action to, to, um, to move toward liberation and freedom, uh, mailing himself from Virginia, from Richmond, mm -hmm. um, to Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. So do you want to talk about this notion of reenactment and histories, since we are still dealing with histories? Yeah, I, you know, it's really tough because I'm like the second you started talking, just, just my heart just started yeah. <laughs> really I know. to do, yeah. and the nerves because yeah. um, such profound lost worlds and emotion and and everything that is just that you're you're beautifully um, recasting, but um, similarly was interested in this particular journey of Henry Box Brown, who I'm sure you all have heard of, and if not, it was a guy and uh, a slave in 1849 and mailed himself in a two by three foot crate, two by three feet, nailed shut from the outside. He could not get out uh, to Philadelphia. Uh, it took 23 hours by steamboat, by carriage, all these different means, um, and he made it. He survived and he mailed himself to freedom, right? The creativity that people were using Un unprecedented, obviously, and you know, scenarios, real world radical scenarios create real world radical solutions. Um, and to me, what was most interesting about that is, is yes, it was creative and yes, it was radical, but it was just like, just to cross that line, just to head in, just the cardinal directions were a way to be free. And so with the Great Migration, and now you know, there's some sort of relative reverse migration, mm -hmm. I thought it would be a gesture, a, a significant gesture, at least for myself, to mail myself in the reverse route, which is from Rhode Island to Hell County, Alabama. Of course, talked about that with, with uh, Walker Evans and, and James G and its relationship to documentary aesthetics in rural poverty. And so I did that, but I did it in a, a, a much larger crate. Um, and my journey was 59 hours, and it was on an open air um, gooseneck trailer. Um, the driver did not know that I was, it was human cargo, which was mainly a, like a legal liability that was kind of like, I didn't, I didn't want him to get in trouble for human trafficking. I'm human trafficking myself, <laughs> like it's not him. Uh, and, and I recorded it with a GoPro, so we have all the footage. Um, and it was in a show at the Ogden um, Museum in New Orleans that, that you know, Valerie, Valerie saw and had a chance to, to share that work with, with her. But one thing that I did on the inside of that, um, inside of the crate, which I think you saw, there were all these words. There's this project I've wanted to do for a long time called the Black Dictionary, which is uh, writing the word black before every word in the dictionary um, manually. Uh, you know, obviously, I mean, to me, the idea that someone is something means most often in the way to use it, they're not something else, but they also get sort of foreclosed into the representational space of that thing. And black representational space as it relates to American, the American visual constitution and the American conceptual constitution is a devastating space to be trapped in. <laughs> and so, you know, how do you, how do you go through the linguistic absurdity of that? You know, what is a black hiccup? 
You know, what is a black, a black elbow? Like these things are, are the consequence of being cast race, being cast black. Um, and they're all embedded in our unconscious. And so I wanted to go through that in an attempt to, to you know, in, in an attempt to, to understand something. And I'm, I've started, but yeah. <laughs> I know what a black elbow is. <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 I brought up some. Yeah, no, I, I felt that black, I felt elbow, black elbow before. before. Yeah, I felt it. It's before. sharp. It's a sharp oh, elbow. It's, it's, yeah, it's got a little point right there. <laughs> um, but I thought the segue from Bethany's. Um, uh, notion of looking and and mm -hmm. and because Henry Box Brown, the impetus for him to to ship himself uh, was the fact that his family was sold away from him. Yeah, um, and he was able to walk with his family uh, as far as he could. He had, had freed himself, and he had raised enough money to to purchase his family mm -hmm. so that they could also live. Um, together as freedmen, uh, uh, and, um, but unbeknownst to him, the deal was made, and his family, his wife and two children were sold, uh, and uh, literally sold downriver is kind of what that means, coming out of Virginia, mm. um, the James River, and you know, um, the, the sort of heart of the domestic slave trade is basically, um, was its mantle beyond being the second uh, capital of the Confederacy, um, but so, but the anguish that he had, mm. that there was nothing left, nothing, no alternative for him, that he was willing to risk life and limb to sell mm. himself, to, to mail himself, excuse me, um, to freedom. Can I add something to that? Yes, because yes. I love the, yeah, being inside of the box and you know, a lot of folks were like, oh my God, you, were, you did what he did. And I'm like, no, no, no. I had escape hatches. Mm -hmm. I had someone who was tracking me. Like, I, I was as safe as one could be doing it. Um, to do, and to be in the box and have that safety, but also to not be able to see the outside world um, in the darkness, I had a light, but it sounded literally like I was in a railroad car the entire time. And so the terror that he would feel, not knowing who's going to open it and when, um, is not the terror of mine. Mine was a performance and a gesture. His was life or death. And also, I'm sure the most spiritual experience he had. I had a spiritual experience being in there, mm -hmm. you know, feeling like I'm legitimately time traveling mm -hmm. because you're, the context of the world is completely erased. And then all you have are these really abstract and terrifying sounds. Um, and so, yeah, I, I imagine, I, I can't imagine, but his, his anguish and journey is, is like, I'm sure, the mo one of the most transformative during that time. Yes, yeah. I mean, he becomes a, 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 a beautiful abolitionist um, and uh, speaks very thoughtfully about, you know, that, that sort of spiritual awakening. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was born out of anguish, but when he emerged from that box, he emerged a totally different person. Butterfly, he, like yeah, caterpillar butterfly. It, it, totally. Um, uh, you know, I think at one point for several hours he was upside down. Yeah. Uh, and thought he would die because the blood was, you know, rushing down to, to his head. Uh, and finally someone, he said, by some miracle, someone flipped the box, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and he survived it. Um, and it had, like, do not flip. It had, like, do not... Uh uh, I forgot the exact word. This side up. Yes. It had this side up on it. Right. Um, and then it had dry goods on it. Exactly. Um, my box had return dry goods on it. And go to Hell County. But I just want to do this because <laughs> I, this is really, I, I think like everyone's like, this is crazy. But like Henry Box Brown, he did it and he was in this position the entire yeah, time. He was crotched. He was like yeah. this. Yeah. Like, like literally like this for 23 hours in a small box. I could like lay down and stuff. So yeah. like completely different. It, it was still bare bones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And when I, I, I happened upon it, I was like, you did what? I think I, I texted. I was like, you did what? <laughs> <laughs> you did that. Like, so, but, uh, yeah. but it, it is, it, it speaks to this notion also of moving from the static into the performative, mm. uh, which is something clearly um, that, that, that you both are, um, moving into and the idea, Bethany, of, of uh, giving voice uh, back to the hymnals, giving voice back to words that were static, weren't static, uh, and bringing that back together. You said something earlier which I loved, which is the, the idea of bound, you know, bringing together and binding 
all of these um, conflicting, dissenting, um, at odd voices. You know, um, the fact that language and song uh, has been used um, for various purposes, propaganda. And what was interesting about Dixie, and we'll bring in John Sims, uh, who you know really looked at the song Dixie. Uh, and putting black in, in the beginning of everything, reimagining Dixie, not from the various iterations that were written for the multiple purposes that the song's melody was used for, uh, from the Confederacy to abolitionists, you know, Lincoln. It was a very popular song when it was first written, and so everyone took the melody and rewrote the lyrics for their own purposes and intents. Um, but John Sims, uh, took that same song, uh, but but had it recreated in various um, genres of black music. Mm. So when you talk about putting black before the the word, you know, to to have Dixie uh, reimagine as blues, as jazz, mm. as calypso, <laughs> as, okay. you yeah. know, it, it had all <laughs> these again. variations of blackness yeah. to the song Dixie. Yeah. Um, but Bethany, do you want to talk about the the sort of overlay of voices? You were talking yeah. about you know the uh, binding them statically but now you've allowed them to be performed and then overlaid so you want to talk about yes but that John Sims piece is the best work I've seen <laughs> it you installed it in the old in the conf Confederate Chapel yeah <laughs> we have a freaky. Confederate Chapel on our grounds by the way it just yeah. felt like the ghosts were fighting because of that installation mm -hmm. in there mm -hmm. a, that was a really good work so, yeah, I'm jealous of that work. It's a good one. <laughs> um, yeah, so, the, so I grew up in uh, Montgomery, Alabama, in a um, very liberal Presbyterian church. And we used to do these 72-hour Bible readings. Mm -hmm. People still do this, and they do it with the Odyssey, too. It's this idea that uh, sacred text, sacred song, it's like worthy of being given back into the world in this very marathon fashion. Wow. So you would sign up for your hour, you know, like you sign up for 3 a.m., you read from, like, you hope you don't get Job, um, and then you hope that, <laughs> Deuteronomy, um, and then you hope that, like, the 4 a.m. person comes and relieves you of your post, because if not, you've got to keep reading. And you stand at the pulpit, and usually the pews are empty, like, mm -hmm. nobody's there to listen. But the idea, and this is true for the performances, is that, and yet, it is still worthy of being read or sung back into the world, even when nobody's listening. Like all of this feels like post-2016 <laughs> metaphors. Um, and so the performance, the first one that I did, was an open call. So anybody could come and sing for 30 minutes. I did this at Locust Projects in Miami. Mm -hmm. I, um, I liked a lot of, <laughs> it was good, it was good, but there was, sorry, there was one, I like a lot of control in my practice, yes, like obsession, control, I keep it tight. Um, there was one singer who like, I don't know what she was singing, it was not the same melody, and it was bad, and I think she did it on purpose. Um, thank you. But then, at the end, <laughs> but at the end, I realized like, oh, that was that was the good thing because it's not always supposed to sound beautiful. Mm -hmm. It should actually sometimes sound horrible because that's true to like this. It's true to our, our national story. And then I've done some future performances. It's never me. I'm. Um, it's never me. It is mm -hmm. like voice embodied through the language of others. That's what I'm interested in. And sometimes they'll sing for short durations, you know, endurance. Sometimes it's eight hours long, and they'll kind of sing until something transition happens, like uh, midnight or dawn or dusk. And then sometimes they're singing all at the same time, like six different singers who are simultaneously. And this was actually installed out in the, on the grounds. Oh, I forget what time is anymore, but I think it was last year. Sometimes there are uh, recordings of the singers, and they're all singing versions of My Country Tis of Thee or the Star Spangled Banner simultaneously. And the intention then is that if you sit in the middle of those recordings of all six voices, then the melody should be consistent. You can mm. still make out what it is, but it is also utter noise, right? Mm. And it is familiar noise. And that also feels like a metaphor for this moment. Mm. It's like familiar, but it's estranging at the same time. I think we live with so much anxiety because there is familiarity and yet there is estrangement. Mm -hmm. Like it's familiar, but 
I don't, there's no, <laughs> nothing that really aligns with my understanding of what these things should really truly be. Yeah. Um, and so I, I see that, um, have we already passed our, our time limit? Yes, we have. Okay. <laughs> yes, because because uh, okay, she said they got the mics. I was told that yeah. there would be signs and symbols of the coming, and so there we are. <laughs> so I think it is now an opportunity to allow you to join us uh, uh, with questions or comments that you'd like to to put forth. So we have uh, attendance on either side. If mm -hmm. you'd like to raise your hand and. Uh, Okay, we have someone here up front. Hi, this, was, this has been great. Uh, the two of you all, even though you use visuals and your words, are so connected. Uh, I am a person who still uses darkroom. So oh, yeah. when you talk about the imagery coming through and you can't really see it, that's what I felt when I'm doing my dark room. Mm. So have you all too, have you all thought about collaborating in mm -hmm. exhibiting? Because you, you speak to each other and it's such a nice fit. And I was just, just throwing that out there for future things. Oh. <laughs> Well, I'll go first. And I'm, I'm in St. Louis, so literally, since I suggested it, you gotta come to St. Louis. How about that? <laughs> well, I mean, I must say, I'm, uh, I'm particularly uh, wowed by Bethany's work, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a, like a sensibility that is so familiar in terms of its content, but it's so radically divergent from the way in which I think but also uh, extremely visceral and moving. And so um, I don't think that her work should be uh, anchored by uh, my thoughts. My, I think Bethany is doing, doing quite well. We had our first collaboration on the bus up here in conversation. <laughs> we chatted a bit. I'm um, a, a really big fan of your work. And yeah, I'm hoping, uh, I'm hoping I can just actually, you know, when I, when I engage with artists, I memorize. So, you know, the poets that I love, the films that I watch, I do the same repetition. Like, I can't help it. Like, I, I'm a song lyric memorizer. I will take it into me, and then it will become part of myself. And I'm not ashamed of it being referenced. I'm not ashamed of it being part of my practice. And so, you know, when I was looking at a lot of your work on the internet this morning, um, I, I was like, whoa, I really need to like dig and like memorize some stuff because some of it was like really like surprisingly <laughs> powerful, you know, like when you come across something like, whoa, it's like I haven't brushed my teeth yet. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's not the answer to your question. 2024. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would do one of your performances, I think, because I, I was going to say, yeah. Oh, voice. thank you. Yeah. yeah, I'd probably do that. Okay, deal. <laughs> deal. <laughs> and, and in St. Louis, I'm understanding this. Okay. Matter. If Valerie's coming. I'm coming. All right. I'm coming. I love, I love me some St. Louis. <laughs> so I'm um, particularly interested in this black dictionary. Mm. Um, I just uh, did a curation, a very small, of a group of artists, and I posed the question of what is white? And um, it was very curious, all of the different responses I got back. And, and then in the end, the lack of follow through from the artists who said they would respond, I think they got hung up on that. But one of the <laughs> things I explored was the definition of white and the definition of black. Mm -hmm. and uh, metaphorically what those mean and how we've been um, ingrained to have connotations of negativity towards black and positivity towards white. And so when you mentioned that um, idea of a black dictionary, um, 
don't give up on that. Like, I'm ready to uh, read your dictionary. <laughs> I'm ready to see and explore that as an artist. And, and as you just mentioned, unabashedly uh, it, memorizing and, and incorporating other artists' work into your own and ingraining that and, and, and uh, sharing that and becoming part of you. That um, Your dictionary, I mean, I, I'm ready. Let's, <laughs> let's see what that is, because I want to explore that further and, mm. um, and pose that and challenge other artists as well. So mm. thank you. It yeah, needs thanks. to be unabridged. <laughs> yeah, it will. It's, it's going to be long. And I, you know, my big goal was to have it actually function as a, a dictionary in schools. And so you have across, I mean, not, not as if it would be accepted in many schools because. Not with critical race. <laughs> not critical race there. <laughs> I'm sure the word black is probably not even in it. And, um, but uh, yeah, I think it can function as both. And I think it's, I just think it's an important relationship to language and, and where we are. And I think that the question you ask about whiteness, it's impossible to ask. because I, I like to say, like, I just wrote this piece, and one li two lines I have in it are, um, the Southern photograph treats whiteness like light and blackness like portraiture, right? Like, one is it all, and the other is something to look at, you know? Um, and the complexity of that problem is almost irreversible. And it doesn't mean it can't, the solution to it's irreversible. The absorption and the, uh, I wanna say the sort of steady countering of it, I think is where what we need to do is be constantly aware of the, the way in which our, our built environment mm -hmm. is a built in environment of a very narrow way of understanding the human being's relationship to each other and to the physical world. Um, and so, yeah, hopefully the work that we're doing can, can speak to some of those grander things. Is it ongoing? The Black Dictionary? Yeah. Oh, the Black Dictionary. So I started it in the crate, and I'm trying to figure out its next iteration. I teach, and I'm like, you know, working on the project. So it's a, it's a three hour, in order to do it, it's a three hour a day, one year, every day, 365 five day commitment. So I'm trying to figure out, you know, like I had an idea to just, you know, write it on all wood pieces or write it in a, like over a barn, like where it's gonna be physically, and mm -hmm. then how it's gonna be contained into an actual book that is, uh, you can disseminate, so. But I'm glad you're, you appreciate it. I've wanted to do it for a long time, but it's, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it'll happen, it'll happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, a landscape in the southern landscape is so particular to both your works, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you work in the landscape, and so much of the work that you're doing that, that speaks to text is based on one's experiences within the southern landscape. So, I mean, it's the question that keeps coming back over and over again, and one that I ask myself because, you know, the, the Dirty South is an intergenerational endeavor. I mean, it's all of the voices coming together. When you talk about that kind of synergy between the two of these on the stage, you know, that synergy happens with, throughout the exhibition with these dialogues. So what does the South mean? I mean, this, this is a question that keeps coming back and forth. I mean, in the absence of the audience having a question. Mm. I'm curious, uh, you're planning yourself in Hill County, but also going back to RISD, going back and mm. forth between the two. Um, so I'm gonna pose the question to both of you, because you live in Atlanta now. And from I Montgomery. did. I did. did. I'm in Chicago now, but I did live in yeah Montgomery and then Atlanta. Well, you live basically in the South if you're living in Chicago. <laughs> so that's right. That's kind yeah. of that works. <laughs> um, you're right. No. Did you want to go first? <laughs> I mean, I'm happy to. This yeah. 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 <laughs> um, well, and this is something like I write a lot, so a lot of stuff I say I've either written or it's in uh, upcoming things, but. I like to, at a piece that I've recently written, I say that the South is not our final origination. You know? Um, it's a place that was our beginning, but to consider it a, the beginning in the way in which it's historically categorized as our beginning of only oppression, of only suffrage, of only despair, of, of only this, with just a couple, a couple cultural beautiful things like music mm -hmm. is, I think, something that, uh, as the reverse migration happens, can be sort of undermined and the reality of, of what the South actually is, which is a reality that most of us can, have never known because we weren't there during its origination. I think that these things can um, 
become more articulable in a way that I think it can even be accepted by myself when most people talk about the South. I'm like, there's, like, one of my favorite things to think about, and I think it has a lot to do with the way I make work and why I, I desire ambiguity so much, is that, you know, and this, it sounds silly, but we don't know what the world sounded like before there were, there were recording devices, right? We don't know what the world looked like before in, in a sort of photographic light being on you know, uh, plastic and then coming in before photograph was around. Like the reality of those worlds are actually lost and then they're interpreted through documentation, through historical text, through all these other things. And so how do we, how do we understand the world that we didn't consent to being in? And how do we understand the world that we didn't consent we didn't consent in its construction and in its building. Um, and to me, for black people specifically, the South is the place to rebuild and to think about, um, you know, to, to just sort of rebuild an origin, you know? Um, I have a piece in this show, and that's, that's like Hell County Dirt, which is like a very, very, very rich and red. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm using, my mom was in the military, I was born overseas, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I use like flag cases, and I fill them with Alabama Hell County Dirt, right? And so our nation starts in the ground, it starts in the land, it starts in the place, it starts in, in the physical world, and then we're free to create our own mm -hmm. conceptual nation, you know, the, the conceptual nation that's been created for us, I completely reject it. I don't know if you all do, but <laughs> I think there's way more. Um, so. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Yeah. No. I, yeah, well, um, I think my work is, sorry, rooted in the South, but I've never called myself Southern. Mm -hmm. And I said this in a talk with the Natasha Trethway once, who I think is from, based from Mississippi. Mm -hmm. and she said, well, if you don't claim it, then everybody else gets to write the narrative. And I'm still trying to work my way around like that. To say I'm from the South, my family is from the South. I was born, you know, like mm -hmm. rooted. But Southern is something different. Yeah. And I can't quite like work my body into that terminology mm -hmm. in a way that I'm comfortable with. But um, hmm. I, did, I, I thought I might have a butt that came after that. And so I said butt before I had the next thing. It's very it's uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> It's home, and it's hard to understand like what makes this place, what makes this, mm -hmm. what defines this place when you're like from it and in it. Mm -hmm. um, it's home, and it is familiar, and it is estranging. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think a lot of the work right now is dealing with like, what does it mean to love a place that doesn't always love you back? Oh, well, that's America in general, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's familiar and estranging. Yeah. yeah. Here's a, a, a Baldwin quote that I use. It's like my artist statement for my photography, which you know, you know very well, um, is that uh, when a Negro, and, and it's speaking to me, I think more so than you, because you were born in the South. My dad's from the South. But um, when a Negro returns to the South, he's witnessing a place you've never been, but one you can't fail but recognize. And I think. I mean, and, and, he, and inside the quote, he says, like the Italian immigrant, like, you know, James Baldwin is not one to think that American blackness is the only oppression in the world and that it's the most important. It's part of a continuum of, uh, of oppression um, and being ostracized and, and erasure, but it's just extremely idiosyncratic mm -hmm. and unique to our landscape. Um, and I feel like even a, a Southerner that has Northern urges, <laughs> I don't know what that means. No one knows what that means. It's not a thing to be meant to be known. Um, and then comes back, is like still dealing with. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Thank you. That's a great place to end. Thank you, Ramel. Thank you, Bethany. Thank you. This has been wonderful. <laughs> Thank you all.